Welcome to Hobby Clubhouse with another look at a rarity from Gundam model history. This time it's the Gundam Shop Volume 1, a Gundam plastic model encyclopedia as it says here on the box. This was released all the way back in 1996 and it made a total of two volumes. Now it wasn't that it didn't sell well, but rather that was the entire Gundam model lineup already for the time in two CDs. I mean it's kind of crazy if you think about it. Now before you run off and think, well I've seen them all in books and catalogs, yes it's true, but that's only for the kids still in production. The real value of this disc are the unreleased products and the prototype it shows off inside, along with a load of discontinued models that have rarely been documented on the internet. And as I just mentioned, the software was released in 1996 and sold for 3,500 yen. There were separate versions for the Windows and the Mac, and you have to buy each version separately. The one I have here is for Windows 3.1 and Windows 95, so it's really really old. And it's a 16-bit application, so there's absolutely no hope of it running on the modern Windows 10 system. But that won't stop me from sharing this with you guys. The recommended specs are here if you're curious. And PCs in 1996 are weak of course compared with ones today, but still the specs here are even more conservative because Bandai wants this to work on as many computers as they possibly could. The software itself was produced by Bandai's hobby branch, so it's entirely a Bandai in-house product which they don't really do anymore. Volume 1 covers 1 year war products, and Volume 2 features everything beyond. So you get an idea of just how many kits they made of 0079 compared with everything else. Now if you have a sharp eye, you'll notice that my copy here looks a little bit off because this one here is a bootleg copy that I got when I was really small. And you know what, I've never seen the genuine thing in the flesh and people online barely know this thing exists at all, and I've never seen anyone selling these. I mean, I'd sure like to get my hands on a pair of genuine copies one day, and you know, one can always hope. Now the front of the box features an RX-78 kit that's been modified quite a bit, and I can't exactly tell which one it is. On the back, we have some shots that give you an idea of what's inside, like a lineup of kits and other details, but we'll get to all of that when we see the software for itself. Other than that, I can't show you the booklet or anything inside since mine is a bootleg and all we have is a sleeve here. Okay, 12 hours later, I've built myself a virtual machine and jumped through lots of hurdles to get us to this desktop here on a Japanese Windows 98. Booting up the program, we can see... Yeah, the music is a choppy mess. And so are the other sounds, but you know what? The good thing is that the other parts of this software actually has no background music. And there are only a few sound effects here and there, so it's not going to affect us a whole lot. And the window itself is really small as you can see here, so the program's going to be blown up quite a bit as we take a closer look. So we first land in this lobby here on the first floor. Now the window may already be really small, but the actual display area is even smaller still. I mean, you have to remember, this software was designed to run on the earliest window systems after all. We get a description of the floor here, so this one is for plastic models, which really means that it's all the things that are still in production way back in 1996. The two arrow buttons down here let you look around the room, which is pretty neat because, you see, we can see the fully stocked shelves all around us. And you may have also noticed that the mouse cursor changes to a horror whenever it mouses over something that can be pressed. Now I don't think modern Windows programs still allows cursors to be messed around like this anymore, and I kind of miss that. In the corner here, we have buttons to quickly access all three floors. And then this toggles help prompts whenever they exist. And then we have a back button. And finally, an exit button that lets us exit the program whenever we're done. Okay, so let's start our tour on this level by looking at one of these shelves. The models here are old, but they're still in production even today. Like all the MSV kits here were just recently re-released. But the boxes shown here are actually the original releases and you can see the old Bandai logo that they adopted way back in 1961 and were still using at the time. And many have no idea this was ever a thing. And probably like how the red Bandai badge is going to be a thing of distant memory too one day. Now let's pick one of these kits to have a closer look. And what better choice than the 1-60 RX-78 which is really in vogue now with builders all over Japan. We first get a painted photo of the kit as you'd expect and each kit features a front and a back view. What's more, you can toggle this little paintbrush switch here, and that'll enable a list of all the recommended paint colors to use with the kit. The information applies to both front and the back views of the kit. 
On the right here, we get some information with the black text being in-universe information on the RX-78 and then the red text on the bottom being about the kit itself. Above it, we get the scale size, the price, and the release date. The bottom buttons here are all really straightforward and we can check out the instructions manual and we really do get the entire thing scanned for us. And that applies to every single model kit on the CD and it blew my mind as a kid to see all of these without having to buy any of them. The package has just a front cover and sadly we can't see the sides of the box. They do credit the box artists whenever they can, and here, this box was illustrated by Mr. Masayuki Hasegawa, who drew nearly all the boxes for the 0079 kit, so you're gonna see his name a lot. The box size is also featured here, and this is actually what inspired me to include the same information in all my reviews on this channel. As a kid, I loved how much this disc told me about each of the kits, even for ones I'd never really be able to buy. Next to the package is something crazy. Drawing doesn't mean the package drawing, but the actual technical diagram of the kit, and you get this too for nearly every single kit. And as far as I know, Bandai has not shown these drawings in any other published books or media since, so this is your only way of seeing them even today. Now sadly, we can't see each and every kit here or else we'd be here all day. But the lineup continues with MSV kits, again, all of which you can still buy at retail in one form or another. And at the end of the MSV lineup, we have something worth a detailed look. The 1990 high-grade RX-78. Of all the kits on this floor, this is the only one that has been discontinued. This was the origin of the high-grade label, and you might think, big deal, right? But this kit is an important step in Gundam model history. This kit was Bandai's first complete overhaul of the RX-78's look. And it was the first time they reimagined the RX-78 beyond the slanty and the curvy animation design. It lays the groundwork for a lot of the aesthetics we recognize today, and it looks a lot less alien to us than the classic kits do. But the manual is really what we want to see here. Being a kit that we can't buy anymore, I want to look through the entire manual here with you, which hasn't been yet covered on YouTube it seems. Bandai was proud of this kit, and they wanted you to know. There is a detailed write-up of how the RX-78 changed the tide of the one-year war with this beautiful two-page spread. And then we get a hatchful open illustration, which clearly you'll recognize as a Katoki illustration. And then the next pages are for all the weapons, and if you're taking count, this is already six pages of detailed writing telling you all about the RX-78. Because Bandai really wanted to use this kit to re-establish and elaborate on all the lore that the RX-78 represents in the universe but there are still two more pages about the One Year War, and we're still not done yet because the next two pages are detailed specs on the Gundam itself. And here, we get the Okawara design markings on this kit. Now this established a trend where Bandai releases a de facto new interpretation of the RX-78, like this one here with the blue lines on the shoulders, and that becomes a reference for all Gundam products released around that period. Like how this Ganso SD Gundam kit references that high-grade design. They did the same with the first Master Grade Gundam, and then they did it again with the RG release now. Finally, after 10 pages of background, we get the actual build instructions. And here we see the transformable core fighter, all the way back in 1990. It kind of made the kit fragile, but that just goes to show you how this was supposed to be the pinnacle of Bandai's technology at the time. The last pages here talk some more about the new technique used here, like system injection that molds plastic of different colors together. And then there's their new joint design. It is exactly like what they're doing with the RG line today, and at the time of this CD, this kit was the best that money could buy. Going back to the shelf, we can see some more MSV kits, and then we finally get to the standard 0079 kits here, first with some 1100 sets. And then on the next page here, we finally get some 1144 sets, and especially the Gundam, which many of you will know that this is the very first Gundam model kit ever produced. But there's something in here that you may not have seen before. So here's the box, which is something that you may have seen very recently with the re-release, and you know, well, what's the big deal, right? Well, it turns out this once had a different box art. So this one with the red background is the true initial box that it was released in, and it just used art from the animation. Now of course, this was later phased out and replaced with artwork from Mr. Hasegawa, but again, this is something I really haven't seen mentioned in any other books I've come across. 
And here's a quick look at the front of the instructions, and we'll be seeing this kit again later, so keep this kit in mind. But that just about does it for all the shelves on this floor. The cashier here has still a little something. Pushing on it gives us an interactive list of all the kits here, and there are buttons on the side to filter out the kits to just about any perimeter you might need, like price, sale, and even class. Just to satisfy your curiosity, here are the things that are not MS, not MA, nor ships. So like the ball, and the weapon set, and subflight systems like the Dodai YS. Okay, so let's go up to the second floor now by taking the stairs here. There's supposed to be a transitional animation of the floor sliding up and down, but it's so fast here we can barely see it. Now this floor is called the movie data floor, though technically it's not just movies. There's only this side of the room here and we can't spin around this time. But let's start our look of this room from the very right hand side with these panels here, which brings up a detailed timeline of the release dates of all the kits recorded on this CD. Now this is a very handy record of all the release dates before such information was widely catalogued on the internet, and some of this is still hard to track down even today. Now I'm going to scroll down the list here and you can pause and look closer at any of the parts you like. This primitive scroll bar here doesn't let me drag, so I had to spam the down button all the way until we reached the bottom of the list. Next to the timeline is a big TV, which of course is for watching video clips. The first page here has some short clips from the animation, and you can see which each of them are, but I'm not going to be showing these in detail because if you've watched the animation, these are just taken straight from that. But this next page is something incredibly rare before the days of YouTube. They're all Gundam model TV commercials. Now, a Japanese YouTube channel has already documented all of these in a higher resolution, but back in 1996, this was a rare and privileged access to media that was already lost to time. Now, the virtual machine chugs and sputters when it tries to play video here, but fear not because I've extracted all of these from the program to show you here. So, let's have a look at all of these commercials back to back. ガンダム。今、オモアの抵抗により劣勢を強いられた従軍は新型モビルスーツの開発を急いだ。ゴック、グフ、ズコック、そして開発ナンバー ソロモンからテキサス、そしてヒカルソラへ。恐怖のモビルアーマー、ビグザム。赤い水星シャー専用ザク。ニュータイプの運命は。RX78ガンダム。無敵のメカニズム。パーフェクトコレクション、機動
宙世紀 WO83MS06R と MS14C からなる重機構モビルスーツ部隊は重要機密を奪取すべくサイドセブンに対し奇襲作戦を開始した。戦士ガンダムバンダイのプラモデル歴史を塗り替えるためにあまたの勇者が消えるそしてまた英雄が生まれるジョニー・ライデン少佐今またフルアーマーオペレーションガンダム部隊との壮絶なる戦闘へ。機動戦士ガンダムバンダイのプラモデル OK now that we're back let's look at this last page here which is a short look at how Gundam models are designed and manufactured again something most people had not seen at the time and is also quite different from the Bandai factories of today the sequence will be showing the following first designing the kit then making the mold next Injection molding, then after that, box art design, then box printing, and finally, box making. So, just like the commercials, let's have a look at these videos together. To the left of the TV here, we have some display shelves, and inside we have some finished builds. And these are all featured in Hobby Japan publications, like this first one here being from Hobby Japan's 1993 October issue. Some others, like this gun cannon, comes from Gundam Weapons, and so does this gun tank here with a set of cannons borrowed from the F 90S type mission pack. Now this photo of a GOG here has already been featured in a number of different publications over the years, and you might recognize this modeler credit here. Yes, that's Katsumi Kawaguchi, or Kawaguchi Meijin as he's more commonly known today. All of these are nice inclusions, but the really tiny pictures makes it impossible to see any of the details in the kits, so the technology of the software really shows its limits here. But that's it for the second floor here. This leftmost shelf is really just the bottom row of the same build photos, so we've already actually seen it. But don't run off yet, because I've saved the best for last, and it's all down in the basement floor. So heading down to the bottommost level takes us to the secret data floor, and they really aren't kidding. But first, the leftmost shelf here is just a credit of the software, and you can pause to have a look if you're interested. Now, this next shelf here are all discontinued models. 
though technically the diorama sets here on the right were re-released in the most recent production run and I believe they were previously really rare kits. But these models here on the left, what the heck are these? The packaging may already have given you a hint, but look at this. This is the RX-78 right out of the box with no painting from 1988. You see, these actually come pre-painted as they so proudly show you with this little cutout window on the box here. It even gets a second illustration on the back. Well, so what on earth are these? Now these are actually the 1144 kits we saw earlier. Yes, these are the exact same molds. The instructions are a little bit nicer, but these kits are just them, but painted for you on the runners from the factory, which is a pretty novel idea. And when I first saw these as a kid, I really wanted to get one so I could see what they're like. But with rare kits like this, we really do have to see each one, don't we? First, we have the Char Zegok, which is very accurately in pink. And then we have the Gun Cannon with the very blocky torso. And then we have the always popular Dom, and here's a quick look at its box. And then we have the Jim and its strangely long legs, and a tiny little beam spray gun. And here's the box with a tantalizing look at the Jim's red and white torso on the runner. And then next is the Goof with some strangely huge gorilla arms. And lastly, the Blue Zegog doing a cute little walk and saying hi to us. And these are truly something rare, and to this day, I've never seen any of these in the flesh. Now how about these flat little boxes up here? If you thought the painted full color models were crazy, Bandai isn't done yet. This is the largely forgotten Eropla line of 1 to 250 models, costing 200 yen from 1983. They were test beds for Bandai's multicolored runner production technology, and we see these commonly today in high grade kits on the A runner. And yeah, they date all the way back to 1983 with these kits, and they come out looking spectacular. The painted model only touches up on some of the details, but they look just fine without them, really. You wouldn't think this was from the same era as those old, goofy-looking 0079 kits at all. The technical drawing shows you just how many pieces this tiny little kit has, and then the instructions here are really quite straightforward. And because these are such rare things, let's look at each of the other kits as well in order. So here's the Shar Zaku, molded in pink and all, and the box is exactly the same as the Gundams and layout. The back here shows the entire runner, which would have been mind blowing to see all this color separation. Next we have the Goof, which has a really weird long neck. And here on the package we have the front and the back side and it's technical drawing, and then lastly, it's manual. And then finally, we have a green Zaku, because of course Bandai would reuse the mold. The package, the front, and the back still shows off the beautiful runner inside the box. Now this one has no technical drawing, probably because it shares the same one as the Shar Zaku. And here are the assembly instructions, which are also identical to the other Zaku. Oh, but there's still more to see. Moving right, we have this gigantic kit here, which recently showed up in a post on Gaia Note's official Twitter account. I mean, what on earth, right? This is the 1 to 30 scale bubble cast model kit, which really means that it's entirely made of styrofoam. Seriously, they made an entire thing out of styrofoam, and it cost a whopping 10,000 yen back in 1983. It comes with metal rods to plug the pieces together, and the energy pipes here are regular PVC plastic, but this is an unorthodox of a model as you can get. Because in case you didn't know, styrofoam will melt away with most solvents, so if you just use normal model paint, the whole thing's just gonna disappear. So you can't just paint this thing all willy-nilly. The box here really dates the kit with the funky disco vibe with the round fonts. And here are the instructions, and you can see that the model is actually a static thing with no moving joints. But all the pieces are solid all the way through. These pages here also give you some guidance on how to prep and paint a styrofoam model kit, which may be the most useless set of modeling skills that's never ever needed anywhere else. And here we have two pages showing off a sample build, in case yours melted and you don't believe it can be done. 
The last page here is for the color guide, as much as you need it for Zaku. Next we have the high complete model series here, which aren't actually models at all, but actually high end action figures. To pick one out as an example, this is the prototype Dong, which we now have a robot Damashi release of it, bringing us around the full circle. Now some parts of these come on runners, but otherwise it comes out looking ready for display. There's really not a lot to say about these, other than that they were really kind of pricey for the time, and they really were high-end products. Now, despite the age that they look, Bandai sold them for quite a while, and I remember seeing these way late into the 90s, but they were eventually discontinued from Bandai and then the remaining stock just kind of sold out, but it really took quite a while and they really lingered around for a time. And then what do we have here? Human character models? Yeah, Bandai made these kits too back in 1981, even though they still haven't quite mastered the art in 2020. And you know what? It's not really like a skill they lost. They always sucked at it even back then. Just look at poor Amuro here, or whoever this is. This is not Amuro. And why is he so chubby? But just like the other series, let's take a look at each one of these one by one as well. Since, you know, we're never really gonna see them. And if you see one, I don't think you really should buy them. So first up here is Kai Shiren, who is okay. They really got his shifty eyes looking quite right. Then we have Frau Bo, and they sculpted her with no chin and a weird rounded cheek so she looks a little bit like a toddler. And she has a haro, but I don't think it's supposed to be so big. Next, Bright Noah is probably the most accurate of the entire lineup. Now they can't do teens and they can't do girls, but for some reason they could do Noah and his beady eyes. But I don't know what person would specifically want a figure of Bright Noah. I mean, this seems like a really strange thing to want. And next we have Sayla, and of course you know this wasn't going to be good. She has large creepy bug eyes and a face that looks like a mannequin. And the box art is nicely drawn though, and you get Char in the back dressed as Quattro before that was a thing. Now the line gets even weirder with Garma Zabi. Now we don't get any of the others. We don't get Giren, we don't get Kisilia, we don't get Dazzle, but we get crybaby goth-haired Garma here awkwardly holding a glass like he's uncomfortable at a party. And yet they got his look just right. Just like Kai, maybe they're just good at making shifty-eyed characters or something. On Garma's background is Ice Lina, who is our next figure. Now Ice who now? Yeah, I hear you. She was barely in the animation, so it's really a mystery why she's here at all. She's the daughter of a former mayor of New York, if that helps anything. But on the bright side, I mean, she's sculpted quite well and it looks like her, even though most of the people won't remember who she is and no one's gonna buy this. Next is Lala, and she has the same weird toddler face problem with a mouth that's way too small. On her box here, we get Char as well in the back, and keep that in your head a little bit, because next we have Char, which you'd think they'd nail because of the helmet, right? Well, but they kind of do, but underneath that, that is not Char. I don't know who that is, but that's not Char. His arm here is doing a weird hover hand thing too, and it looks very unnatural. Now about the box, Lala has Char in the background, and Char has a Zaku in the background. So we know this man's priorities. We feel you, Char. We, we get it. We all get it here. Lastly, we have Matilda, which old fans really, really seem to like, and I've never quite understood why. The painting here is unfortunate, and they have some clown makeup thing going on here. Now, I can't really blame them, since clearly these were all made by men and painted by men, all of whom probably really, really, really didn't want to make and paint dolls, let alone paint makeup on them. And in the background of her box, she has her Medea, and that's always an unfortunate reminder of her fate. And there we have it, all the human figures Bandai made way back in 1981. And here we have the short-lived Micro Gundam line of figures, which I've briefly mentioned in my Bandai 1994 catalog video. But let's have a quick look at these system injection made fully articulated figures from 1994. First here we have the Char Zaku, which if you look closer actually has the lower body of a Zaku F set. And they didn't mess up here, this is really how they meant to be sold. Next is the Black Tri-Star High Mobility Zaku, which you've seen many many times before and has no surprises. 
Now this next one here is supposed to be the Shin Matsunaga High Mobility Zaku, but the photo here they messed up and this one has an FZ torso, which this is actually something they released later. But the photo in the back shows the proper figure with the regular Zaku look. Next we have a green Zaku with the same weird shake up as the Char Zaku and has the same Zaku F set lower torso. It uses the exact same mold right down to the antenna on the head and they never made one with a smooth head without the antenna and that's really how short this line survived on the market. Down here we have our first Gundam and this one being the Gundam armor type which has the arms and the backpack of the full armored Gundam but the torso is of the regular Gundam plus some change detailing. Last in the lineup we have the RX-78 with a yellow blade antenna which calls to mind the 0079 movies' laser disc cover and the shield is a bluish gray which is a little bit unfortunate. And that covers all the discontinued items included here. It's quite a lot of stuff, but there is still more stuff you've never seen. Some crazy stuff. So crossing the stairs to the other side on the shelves here are the records of Bandai's unreleased models. Starting first with the 1100 Juagu. Now they had the full technical drawing of this kit, but they probably never made any prototypes. Next, we get Xeon Zanzibar Battleship in the bigger 1 to 1200 scale. Now, they did make this at half the size at 1 to 2400, and I'm not sure if this was really in that high of a demand, but the drawing here is actually quite simple, so I guess they gave up on this idea quite soon into the production. Next is the Magellan, and this one is the other way around. We got a 1 to 1200 release, but not this in half the size. So it's a mystery how they picked which ones they made in the end, but it's clear in the beginning they wanted to make all of the ships in both sizes. Now next we have this bizarre 1 to 250 articulated Zgok. Now the diorama sets come with 1 to 250 mobile suits, but those aren't articulated. So this one looks like Bandai wanted to make all their models in another smaller scales, and they never did. And all we have is this drawing, which seems quite far along. And I looked, and this isn't the same build as the Eroplot model, so this is an entirely separate thing they never made. Now next is a gem with a bit of story behind it. The worker Zaku here had this drawing for a 1144 release, which many people would have liked for kit bashing today. But alas, we never got it. Or did we? Because here is the box with the proper box art and everything, and how could that be, right? Well, it turns out that in 2006, Bandai made this set of candy toys called the Gunpla Collection Volume 1. And these scaled down the 1144 kits to half their size. And in this, they made the worker Zaku, this one right here. Yeah, that's nuts. The build of it follows this exact drawing. So in the end, this did get made many, many years later as a candy toy product. I mean, I sure wish I knew about this gem at the time and I would have gotten myself a set back then. And lastly, Look what we have here. It is the perfect Xiang in 1144 scale, which is something we don't have. We have it in Master Grade at 1100, but we don't have a 1144 model even today. I think this will change with the real grade Xiang at some point, but as of this moment in this video, this is our only glimpse of what could have been. And those are Bandai's secret archives of unreleased items. But, but, but there's still a little bit left because we still have this very last shelf here, and these are Bandai's prototypes, beginning with this wooden sculpt of a Zaku. Now Bandai used these wooden sculpts way back before 3D printing was even close to being a thing, because metal molds are crazy expensive and you just can't make one on a whim, so they prototype products with soft woods first. And here we can see that they considered giving the model a base for display, which was cut later as no Zaku models ever came with any kind of a display base. Next is the 1 to 1200 Salamis, which I think they mislabeled in some way because they say here it's unreleased, but we did get a 1 to 1200 model. And the build of this seems to be the same as my final model here, with the stand looking a little bit different, so I think this is more likely a prototype of the final model that we got in the end. Next here is the public class space vehicle, and the scale isn't listed here, so I don't know how big it is. The model here looks quite far along with the two big missiles here being quite nicely detailed. Now it wasn't released in the end, but I don't think a lot of people are going to lose a lot of sleep over not getting this weird little plane, but it's something. 
Next here is the prototype of the Agu Guy model. And you can see that the shape of the head is really rough. And the final product isn't angled nearly as high up and the angles on it isn't nearly as sharp. Next we have the Ugg, which looks almost like the final 1144 product, except for the cartoony shape of the eyes and they sharpened it a little bit in the end. And this one here also has a really odd tanuki color scheme as well. So next one is a strange one. It is an entire space colony. So at one point, Bandai wanted to make a small desktop display of Side 7. I mean, it's clearly quite small here, but I imagine it would be a pretty interesting thing to have at work or something as a display. And I'm not sure how they plan to make those small little stocks, which are clearly metal rods here. Or the colony cylinder itself would have looked quite ugly in just sky blue and they didn't use clear plastic. I mean, but either way, we never got the final product. And next, we have a really chubby prototype shard Z-Gok with a blocky waist and really thick thighs and chubby arms. I mean, he really lost a lot of weight before we saw it on the final store shelves and I mean, good work my man. Then comes a fat prototype Juagu, and I'm seeing a bit of a pattern here. But this one is clearly even more plump with a huge body and some seriously thick legs and some really puffy arms. But this also shows you just how much fine tuning Bandai did even back then to reach even those goofy models we sometimes laugh at from way back then. So they really deserve some appreciation for putting in all that work instead of just giving us fat mobile suits. And you know what? We've gone through the entirety of Gundam Shop Volume 1. This is a strange time capsule and the secret area here is especially eye opening as Bandai really doesn't mention these things anymore anywhere else. Gundam models are really growing in popularity, especially in North America, but I imagine many people don't know about all this history in the early days of Gundam models, so hopefully this has been a nice introduction just as it was for me when I was small in 1996. Thank you so much for watching, make sure to come look us up on social media, links are in the description below. Or hang out here some more and check out volume 2 of Gundam Shop. But before you go, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon to be notified of new videos from Hobby Clubhouse, and I'll see you next time.